Good morning, St. Mary's. It is Friday morning, which means I'm chilling in bed while you are up praying. <laughs> I kid, of course. Um, thank you so much for joining in. Um, and it's a joy to join you, however um, we are joining, to get, joining together today. I wanted to begin this morning um, by thinking a little bit about yesterday's readings um, and the difficulty around that judge's reading and sort of the violence that's inherent within and sort of a lack of explanation and certainly a lack of context around that reading. Um, and I don't want to spend a lot of time thinking and dwelling on that reading, to be completely honest with you, but to think about the process of what is happening with us as we encounter these readings. I suspect some of us, for the very first time, um, I certainly had that had that sense of like, I might have read this before, but it has been a long time, and so it hit me very much as a new reading and not quite sure what to do with that. And as as we were praying yesterday... Um, I will chalk it up to the Holy Spirit. I felt, I felt drawn to an essay, a very short essay that I had read once upon a time, um, by a by an agrarian um, and a and a philosopher and a writer named Wes Jackson. Um, I highly commend Wes Jackson's work to you if you haven't read it. Um, but he wrote an essay called "Hardening Off." Very very short. It's one page, but it occurred to me just as we were praying that. There is, some, there is something going on here, which is good for our spirituality, even if that reading is disturbing in some way. And so I wanted to read you a little piece of his essay um, that might give us some perspective about what God might be doing with us as we engage some of these passages that, yes, indeed, do bother us at times. And Jackson writes, I once planted some seeds of a wild winter annual in small pots in a greenhouse. They were painstakingly watered and fertilized and produced a green, luxurious growth, surpassing in overall vegetative vigor their relatives in the field. From experience, it was known that if we moved these plants from the cozy greenhouse environment and left them outside, they would be vulnerable to the very environment which had shaped their ancestors. A high percentage would be unable to withstand the shock and might die, not because they lacked the genetic potential to resist the environmental extremes, but because the narrow greenhouse environment had not called forth the broad spectrum of genetic potential necessary to endure the adversity usually present to wild populations. Jackson goes on and he talks about the United States. I pray that we might hear the word church in place of that. I'll read his words, but invite you to hear church. The United States as a developed country might be regarded as a greenhouse culture. We lately anticipate that our cozy environment may fast disappear. In fact, only a few supporting subsystems responsible for our affluence need falter, and we will find ourselves out in the cold. But then he goes on. He says, there is a way to gradually prepare greenhouse plants for a full life outside. It is called hardening off. By placing the plants outside a few hours a day at the beginning and gradually increasing the amount of time they are left outside, eventually they can be safely left there. And then he concludes. He says, We know that if we jump too quickly into the world of the future, we might become so discouraged that we refuse to venture out again. We hope that one day we may regard being whipped by the wind as being touched by the earth rather than threatened with wilt. But that can happen only if we have been properly hardened off. Now, again, I appreciate these are selections out of a, a slightly longer essay um, that lays out this idea. But I wanted to read that for you because I think that's one of the ways these readings can function for us. Is that in a lot of ways, we have all been brought up in a church environment that seeks to protect us. We've been brought up in greenhouse cultures where we read the nice stories and we read the easy stories. Or when we read the difficult stories, we're giving an easy explanation as to what that might mean. And we presume that everything in faith is ultimately good and nice and lovely and beautiful and all that. And so much of that is true. But in so many ways, we have been coddled and protected so that when the more difficult seasons of life come around, we're actually unequipped. Not because we don't have the genetic material. We have the material in our faith to deal with this. But we have not been exposed to the realities necessary to allow that genetic potential, allow our faith to come to full bloom and for us to, in, to, for us to engage the difficult questions of our age. These kinds of readings force us to express that genetic material. 
it forces us out of the greenhouse culture and forces us into the real world. The real world where things g- do get ugly and nasty and, and violent at times. But we do it in the context of prayer, little by little by little. Not trying to swallow it all in one fell swoop, but we need to be hardened off. And so hopefully one day, as we encounter the really difficult questions of our age, as Jackson says, we hope that one day we may regard being whipped by the wind, these environmental forces, these realities around us, that we would, we would regard them as being touched by the earth rather than threatened with wilt. Sometimes these readings feel like our faith is being threatened, when actually we're just growing into the environment and we're expressing a fuller faith that is able to thrive in the world that we actually live in. And so as we encounter these difficult readings, I pray that you would see it not as a threat, not as a disruptive force, but rather is calling something forth out of us that is already present. We just haven't practiced it quite as much that these readings, especially from the Old Testament, which can be difficult, which we so often ignore, actually are growing our faith in ways that maybe we don't even quite yet appreciate. And so I pray that that brings some comfort to us as we struggle through some of these readings. Um, They are not always pretty. They are not always beautiful. They are not always comforting. But they are all forming us. And that is the point. And so, friends, let us jump in. It is July the 3rd. And so I'm going to invite you, as we always do, to quiet your hearts, to bring yourself fully and completely into your space, into the presence of God as we begin to pray. O Lord, let my soul rise up to meet you as the day rises to meet the sun. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Our collect for the week of June the 28th. Merciful God, give us the same attitude as Jesus, who emptied himself and was obedient to you all the way to his death on the cross. Make us eager to center the experience of others, that together we might discover a world of compassion and hope. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And our antiphon for today, Jesus, Savior of the world, come to us in your mercy. With this in mind, we pray the words of Psalm 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. O Lord, my stronghold, my crag, and my haven. My God, my rock in whom I put my trust. My shield, the horn of my salvation, and my refuge. You are worthy of praise. I will call upon the Lord, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. He delivered me from my strong enemies and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into an open place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. To our antiphon, we return saying, Jesus, Savior of the world, come to us in your mercy. And so, friends, we return to the book of Judges, chapter 4. We'll be reading verses 4 through 23. Today, we read the story of one of the real, one of the first real. Um, female leaders in the life of Israel. This is an exciting story indeed. Um, Read the story of Deborah and Barak. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. 
She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Ab Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take position at Mount Tabor, bringing ten thousand from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and ten thousand warriors went up behind him, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had separated from the other Kenites, that is, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had encamped as far away as Elon, I can't even pronounce that, which is near Kadesh. When Sisera had told, was told that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the troops who were with him, from Hashareth HaGoim to the west Wadi Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day on which the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. The Lord is indeed going out before you. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 warriors following him. And the Lord threw Sisera and all his chariots and all his army into a panic before Barak. Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot, while Barak pursued the chariots and the army of Hashoreth Hagoim. All the army of Sisera fell by the sword. No one was left. Now Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between King Jabin of Hazor and the clan of Heber the Kenite. Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Have no fear. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. Then he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. He said to her, Stand at the entrance of the tent, and if anybody comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly into him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground. He was lying fast asleep from weariness, and he died. Then, as Barak came in pursuit of Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there was Sisera lying dead with the tent peg in his temple. So on that day God subdued King Jabin of Canaan before the Israelites. Then the hand of the Israelites bore harder and harder on King Jabin of Canaan until they destroyed King Jabin of Canaan. This is the word of the Lord. We continue our reading following along with Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 14, reading verses 19 through 28. But Jews came there from Antioch and Iconium and won over the crowds. Then they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples surrounded him, he got up and went into the city. The next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. After they had proclaimed the good news to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, then on to Iconium and Antioch. There they strengthened the souls of the disciples and encouraged them to continue in the faith, saying, It is through many persecutions that we must enter the kingdom of God. And after they had appointed elders for them in each church, with prayer and fasting they entrusted them to the Lord, in whom they had come to believe. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there, from there, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had completed. When they arrived, they called the church together and related all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith for the Gentiles. And they stayed there with the disciples for some time. 
This is the word of the Lord. Returning to our antiphon, we pray, Jesus, Savior of the world, come to us in your mercy. Our reflection for today comes from the 20th century Presbyterian theologian and writer Frederick Buechner, whose, um, whose sermons I highly commend to you. And he wrote, The grace of God means something like, Here is your life. You might never have been, but you are, because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Nothing can ever separate us. It's for you I created the universe. I love you. There's only one catch. Like any other gift, the gift of grace can be yours only if you'll reach out and take it. Maybe being able to reach out and take it is a gift too. We turn our thoughts to our friends who are in need of our prayers this day. Um, and the only request, um, I'm recording in the afternoon on Thursday, so if there's things that have come in um, later in the day, I apologize that they haven't been lifted up today. Um, but was alerted to one, um, and we'll invite you simply to pray for Maddie. Um, and that's all that I'm at liberty to say, and that's all that we need to know, for indeed God knows the need. Um, and so would invite you to remember Maddie in your prayers, as we will do so today. And so, friends, let us pray for our friends. Our Lord and our God, Lord, this definition that Beaconer gives us of the grace of God reminds us and calls us to consider these readings yet again. That first and foremost, we remember the gift of life, that we wouldn't have to exist, and yet we do, which speaks to the goodness that you have and the love that you have for each and every one of us. We also remember, O oh God, that here is the world laid out in front of us, this thing that you have created, which, yes, is corrupted by sin, but yet still shows your fingerprints of goodness. And, yes, beautiful and terrible things will happen, Lord. And we see that in the pages of Scripture, these horrible, terrible things that do happen, and then at the same time these beautiful, remarkable moments of your grace shining forth, even in the midst of them. And so, Lord, help us to take your most present advice in all of Scripture to say, fear not, do not be afraid, because you promise that you are with us, and that nothing, absolutely nothing, is able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so, Lord, hoping, knowing, believing that all this is true, we ask, Lord, that you would strengthen us to reach out and to grab it, Lord, all of this grace is present all over everything you have made, us and the entire world. And all we need to do is grab hold of it. And Lord, maybe even you need to do that work for us. That maybe even our ability to grab isn't our own ability, but rather is an extension of your grace. And so Lord, help us to live in that grace by simply being able to grasp and to comprehend how deep and how wide, how long and how beautiful is your love for us. Lord, let our lives be shaped according to these realities. Let our lives be shaped by faith and hope and love. And Lord, as our lives are shaped, may we, in our very small ways, do all that we can to shape this world into a place where faith and hope and love abide and to rediscover the universe's fundamental disposition towards love. And so God, we attempt to practice love simply by pronouncing the names of those who, have, who seek our prayers. Lord, we say their names out loud as your children. We say their names out loud as people who have needs and need you to hear their names. 
we say their names out loud so that we might be touched as well and come alongside them and walk alongside our neighbor. And we say their names confident, Lord, that you are present to them, that you have not left them and you have not forsaken them. And so, Lord, on this day, we would lift up our dear sister Maddie to you. And we simply offer her body, mind, and spirit to your kind and gentle mercy. And we ask that you would care for her. We pray also for Doris Bortner, for the family of Mike Lippman and Sandy Suit, for Sandra Duttera, Marge Garrett, and the family of Louise Campbell. We pray for Dottie and Dusty Freeman and the family of Don Bailey, for Alan Showalter and Nancy Studi, for Morgan and for Casey Finn, for Jeremy Dutterer and Riley Black, Dave Morschbacher, for Lacey, for Jared Brown, Perry Lyons, Chelsea Sire, for Judy Most and Melinda Sims, for the family of Derek Householder, for Ann Wilson and Dawn Penny, for Drusilla Short and Scott Davis, Brian Cunningham, Tom Cross, Sherry Armstrong, Dave Cunningham, and Caroline Will. We ask, O oh God, that you would hear us as we pray, both with our mouths and in the silence of our hearts. Friends, with trust and with hope, we pray the words that we have been taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, we pray for strength and trust in times of trouble. Equip us to be your hands and feet in the world. May we bring good news to all we meet this day with our words and with our lives. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, my friends, may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Amen indeed, friends. Another day with a bit of a rough ride. But, uh, but at the same time, we remember that God's in the story of Deborah in particular, that God's grace and mercy is not limited to any kind of person or any class of person or any style of person, but rather that God's grace is expressed in and through all of us and even all the way back in ancient times um, when women would have had no rights and no, no ability to express themselves almost whatsoever. Here we have a female leader of Israel doing remarkable things and moving the people forward towards land. And so for that, we can take some courage and some strength. And so, friends, I pray that you have a wonderful day today, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Peace and good, my friends. <laughs>